Okay, so welcome to the NWR online conference. I'm Vicky Wardridge and I'll be your host this afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us for today's talk, Cannabis Seeing Through the Smoke, which forms part of our online conference, Drugs, Herbs and Medicine. Our speaker today uh, is none other than Professor David Nutt, and his talk today will focus on the failure of drug laws to reduce to reduce drug use and harm and the collateral damage that these laws have made to research and development of new treatments for mental illness. He will suggest more rational, humane and economically sensible policies. We're very excited to have you with us today, Professor, and thrilled to welcome you as part of our online conference. Um, so without further delay, I shall now hand you over to your speaker for this afternoon, Professor David Nutt. Well, thank you. It's uh... It's great to be talking to you. It's great to know about you. I haven't uh, heard of the organization before, but you're obviously uh, a progressive, forward-thinking uh, female group. And uh, hopefully you won't know everything I'm gonna tell you. Um, you might learn something, I hope. So I'm a psychiatrist, uh, a neuropsychopharmacologist, which means I study the effects of drugs in the brain. And uh, I've been, thinking about and working with and researching cannabis for about 20 odd years now. Some of you might have heard of me. 10 years ago in 2009, I was a government chief drugs advisor and I was sacked. And this is the front page of the week during my sacking. Um, and uh, I was sacked in part uh, for saying that cannabis was more harmful than alcohol and tobacco. And you can see the a book of cannabis falling from my hands as I'm dragged away from my laboratory by the uh, the Home Secretary at the time, Alan Johnson. And uh, at the time, I was pretty sure I was right that uh, that uh, cannabis was less harmful than alcohol and tobacco. But uh, now I know I'm right because just a few years later, this man, who you might remember, President Obama, agreed with me. And uh, and the reason he said what he said was by that point in America, about 100 million Americans had access to medical cannabis. And uh, it was then, and still is illegal under federal law. So the feds, the Drug Enforcement Agency, as you might have heard of them, were destroying pharmacies that contain medical cannabis. There was an internal war going on. And Obama said, this is silly. The state has voted for it to be a medicine. And even though it breaches federal law, I'm not going to allow this battle. So uh, he stopped the Drug Enforcement Agency attacking pharmacies and uh, justified it on the grounds that cannabis is less harmful than alcohol, which of course is widely available in America. And, uh, and since that time, a lot has changed in the States. So now over 200 million Americans, that's a way of uh, two, nearly two thirds have got access to medical cannabis and about 150 million have got access to recreational cannabis. In the UK, it's about four people have got access to medical cannabis and none to recreational cannabis. So there's huge international differences, which are interesting, not just for historic and political reasons, but also because they, they help generate data, which uh, exposes some of the uh, strangeness of the UK position. But before I get on to the modern day, I want to just go back and um, to the very beginning. And cannabis has had a role in medicine for a very long time, but also in religion. Not a lot of people realize that the uh, some of the underpinning principles of the Hindu religion, which has been around for considerably longer than um, Christianity, uh, are based on the experience of the psychological experiences of taking cannabis. And so you may know that there was uh, a drink called Soma that was obviously plagiarized by all the sites in Brave New World, but which was around for some six or 7,000 years ago. And uh, it was probably a combination of cannabis, ephedra, a stimulant and magic mushrooms, a psychedelic. And, uh, and still today, uh, cannabis is used uh, for religious purposes. There are these uh, religious uh, ascetics called the sadhus in India who essentially are stoned on cannabis all the time. And 
at the festival of holi the uh the whole population of india gathers to to drink uh, a drink called bang which is a essentially a cannabis milkshake uh, i think one of the reasons the hindu gods are so exotic and interesting is because they were conceived under the influence of uh, of cannabis and cannabis has also had quite an interesting role in western arts again not a lot of people know this but the Dutch school, Rembrandt and his school, uh, used cannabis. Rembrandt thought cannabis was a very good way or a good tool to help his pupils understand appreciations of colour and depth. And uh, and this is one of his uh, paintings. This is kind of relevant to today, isn't it? Because it's the, the meditation of a philosopher. And in those days, philosophers and scientists were one in the same. There's the philosopher thinking and there's his, his um, assistant brewing up interesting um, cannabis cocktails. And cannabis was central to the development of jazz. It uh, became popular in the 1910s, 20s in the US. And there's a scientific explanation of why cannabis allows syncopation, which is, of course, the central feature of jazz, because it, cannabis changes the interaction of the parts of the brain which you need to do music and here's a great quote from louis armstrong he's uh, basically he loved the, the gauge and he said that he, he could never perform without having some cannabis it was part it allowed him the fluidity of thinking that made him such a great musician but it was also a medicine this is a you know the bones of a Siberian princess who uh, died of breast cancer. We know that because of the tumor eating away at her chest wall. And when she was buried, she had with her packets of cannabis, which we believe she smoked to ease pain. So that particular um, body goes back over two and a half thousand years, but it actually goes back longer. Cannabis was first recorded in the pharmacopoeia as a pain relieving medicine two and a half thousand years BC. So that's nearly 5,000 years ago. And in India, about 2,000 years ago, it was used in Ayurvedic medicine, it still is today. Um, the thing I find most amusing is that the Chinese character for cannabis is the same character as for anesthesia. So, so they were very clear that uh, there was a, a numbing effect on pain uh, from cannabis. And uh, it's... Uh, essentially been a medicine in most parts of the world ever since then, until the modern era when uh, governments like ours in the US decided they wanted to eliminate it because people were using it recreationally. It's also not widely known that uh, the British Empire was built on drugs. And there were two main uh, sources of that income. The one that people are familiar with was opium. And you'll probably all know of the, uh, the opium wars when we uh, besieged cities like Shanghai to insist on the government of China at the time opening up the uh, corridors through which we could sell opium to the Chinese people against their will, or not against the will of the people who were quite keen to take it, but against the will of the government. Uh, and that opium came from India, uh, and the argument the British made at the time was that we were buying an enormous amount of tea from China, so we were in a, an economic imbalance with China. It's kind of rather reminiscent of the situation we're in today, isn't it? But uh, then we decided to force the Chinese to buy opium, and it was successful for a while, a few 20, 30 years, uh, but it created quite a legacy of of a hatred, which I think in part explains the antipathy the Chinese have to us today. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see what was going on in India, and there you see Indian workers harvesting cannabis. And uh, cannabis was very, very widely used in India uh, then and is today. Um, but the, <laughs> the British East India Company decided that it would take control of the market. So it, it banned home production of cannabis and insisted that uh, all cannabis 
that was sold was sold through um, through their markets, uh, and so that produced an enormous amount of uh, of income to the to the UK. And I I often like to make my students at Imperial College think a little bit when I give them their first lecture of the the year on on drugs and drug policy, and I I ask them who funded this wonderful institute or institution that sits right next to the Albert Hall, this great towering edifice of Queen Victoria's Tower. And of course, they don't realize it was funded on drug sales to, to India and opium to China. Cannabis became a medicine uh, as a result of our understanding and our use of cannabis in India. This doctor here, Dr. Shunasi, was a doctor working with the East India Company, and he realized that cannabis was an enormously useful medicine uh, for many different indications. And he came back to Britain in the 1840s, set up pharmacies, and he sold a whole range of cannabis products. And uh, one of the most remarkable insights that he gained from India was the use of cannabis to treat disorders of uh, consciousness, which we now call epilepsy, and also tetanus, spasms of the spine. And uh, so we've known for a couple of hundred years nearly that cannabis was a, a very interesting treatment, particularly for childhood seizures. Uh, but as I'll show you, there's still most doctors today refuse to believe that evidence. And uh, Queen Victoria was really rather taken by cannabis. It, her physician, uh, the Queen's physician, Russell Reynolds, was an absolute enthusiast for medical cannabis. And, uh, and he wrote what at the time was the definitive text on how to use cannabis. So here you see this. Uh, there's an, almost a whole issue of the Lancet in 1890 was taken over to him explaining all the medical values of cannabis. And Queen Victoria wrote letters to her uh, friends and, uh, and family um, talking about the value of cannabis to, to help with the pains of um, menstrual pains and also to deal with the, the post the pains of having children. Of course, she had quite a few. Um, in fact, cannabis was a medicine in Britain until 1971. And, um, and then it was banned, and it was banned largely because the Americans had banned it back in 1934, and were really angry that we weren't doing what they told us. So eventually we conceded to their demands to ban cannabis, but we couldn't ban it simply. We couldn't say we did it because the Americans told us. So, so what we did was we created a, a fictitious scare about the harms of cannabis. And there were two GPs in um, in West London, in Notting Hill, who were prescribing cannabis medicine and telling people to use it recreationally. Uh, and those GPs were then uh, struck off the register. And to prevent recreational use, cannabis was banned um, as a medicine, even though there was very little evidence it was being diverted. There's no other drug in history that has been banned simply because two GPs misused it. But that tells us the decision to ban it was definitely a political one rather than a scientific or health one. Oops. So where did the where did the desire to ban cannabis come from? And there were really four pillars of prohibition. The top left hand one came originated in the nineteenth late nineteenth century with the temperance movement. The temperance movement started off attacking. Well, it's not attacking all drugs. It, it was particularly concerned about alcohol and particularly concerned about um, sedating children with tinctures of morphine and opium. But it also was pretty much against all drugs. And of course, it became extremely important in the early parts of the next century when it succeeded in America and Sweden and Finland and Norway in getting alcohol banned. And, uh, and that ban of alcohol turned out to be not a very good idea. At least it certainly wasn't good for the state of America, but particularly in terms of um, the fact it led to a massive increase in organized crime and the growth of the mafia. But that was the beginning of the prohibition construct. Uh, and um, I'll talk more about the bottom left one, Harry Anslinger, in the next slide. 
There's also political expediency, which has always been one of the major reasons why people have banned any drug. And also there was commercial interest, competing commercial interests. And drugs like morphine, um, drugs like aspirin, which are also plant-based products like cannabis, have maintained their status as available medicines, uh, um, even over-the-counter medicines like codeine because they were made by pharmaceutical companies and they were basically companies got patents to on plant extracts that they had subtly changed so that they could be considered new molecules and therefore patentable. But they couldn't extract cannabis in a functional way from the plant, so they couldn't patent it. And therefore they opposed it. And there was a great desire to stop people using cannabis for pain and rather use morphine for pain which as i guess most of you know ended up being an extremely stupid thing in terms of the vast the greater harms that comes from you come from using opiates and from cannabis and it's one of the drivers for uh, the at least in america people swinging back from op uh, and using medical cannabis to reduce the use of opiates but the American story is the central one because uh, uh, then America essentially controlled all international policy and drugs. And it was in 1932 when this man, Harry Anslinger, was faced with the rather unpleasant reality that alcohol was going to be made, illegal, made legal. And when alcohol was made illegal in, in 23, uh, it created such an enormous underground use of alcohol, the so-called speakeasies, which were present on pretty much every street corner, that every, um, every policeman in America was corrupted. And that was obvious uh, because drinking was hardly uh, imp impeded by the prohibition. Uh, and so the government set up this uh, separate organization, which is now called the Drug Enforcement Agency, an army of 35,000 men. You may have heard of them as the Untouchables, Elliot. Oh, what was his name? I forgot his name now. But, uh, but see, there was a whole TV series on it. Um, and uh, this man was the head of them. And he became extremely famous. He was second. He was more famous than the president. He was the only person in America more famous than him was Edgar Hoover. And then he was faced with unemployment, as was his army. And he realized that uh, well, he didn't want that. So he had to create something else for the Drug Enforcement Agency to do. And he, um, he decided to scare people about cannabis. And he was very successful. You see, he managed to get an enormous amount of media interest in the harms of cannabis. But he did it in a, in a way which is very typical of... Uh, uh, of uh, American political figures, particularly uh, resurrected by Donald Trump, in that he decided to blame Mexico for the problem. He changed the name cannabis to the Mexican term marijuana. And then he started putting out scare stories of Mexicans crossing the border, giving young white men uh, cannabis so that they went mad. You see the brief of madness there, one of those uh, images on the right. And of course, the scare stories were always associated with these pictures of semi-naked women um, to induce people to, to read the stories. And this is all completely fictitious. It was very racist, but it, it served its purpose. They kept the army going. Cannabis was uh, made illegal. And with the absurdity that you know, only really um, the Americans can can kind of get away with. They banned it as a medicine, even though it had been a medicine for hundreds of years. And that ban was approved by the League of Nations. And in fact, one of the reasons, the Americans were pretty angry with us because we were one of the few countries in the world that didn't go along with the ban. Uh, <clears throat> of course, the ban of medical use had no impact whatsoever on recreational use. And it, hasn't, it, it didn't when we eventually in 71 banned it in Britain. In 1961, the first UN convention on, on drugs led to an, an international ban. Uh, and that was interesting, politically interesting as well, because at that time, most people realized that cannabis wasn't actually that big a problem, wasn't a disparate issue. But there was one, one Egyptian government official who was convinced that 
all psychiatric disorder in Egypt was due to cannabis use. And uh, so he lobbied the US to enforce an international ban. They didn't want to, but he said, if you don't do it, we're not going to give you some air bases. So, so they got America got the air bases, Egypt got the international ban. And, uh, and, and that ban persists today. The United Nations still bans cannabis. It even, the United Nations still bans medical cannabis, even though the WHO eventually, two years ago, accepted that cannabis was a medicine, but the UN have blocked it. And that was bad enough, but it got even worse with Nixon, when Nixon was trying to get elected in the 1968 campaign. Oops. And uh, as you probably know, he instigated a war on drugs. And the reason he instigated that war on drugs was to deflect people against the war in Vietnam. He was pro the Vietnam War, but that, the American people weren't. So they wouldn't have elected him if that was his, the young... Um, the uh, platform he stood on. So he had to create something else to scare them. And, you know, there are really strange similarities with what's been going on in the last uh, few weeks with um, scare stories about uh, about people coming across the channel. Uh, uh, the fear was generated in other people. And this man, John Ehrlichman, was the brains behind this campaign. And he said this after the campaign he said this the nixon campaign had two enemies the anti-war left and black people we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black i mean they probably thought about it um but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily we could disrupt those communities we could arrest their leaders raid their homes break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. That was a fantastic campaign. Nixon won every state except Maine. Uh, and the war on drugs continued since then. But afterwards, Ehrlichman said this. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. And the truth is, the same happened in Britain to a lesser extent. But in the 2000s, the Labour government under then Gordon Brown, decided it would try to win the 2010 election by being harder on drugs than the Tories of David Cameron, who were being very hard on drugs. And something rather unpleasant happened and somewhat rather dishonest, uh, perhaps not as dishonest as some of the more recent problems with prime ministers, but uh, this man, Gordon Brown, did a deal with Daily Mail it was kind of a weird thing, isn't it? You know, the Daily Mail being the, the most right-wing newspaper in Britain, and this man being a, a socialist of sorts. Uh, but he couldn't do a deal with the Sun like um, Blair had done because he'd fallen out with Murdoch. So he went and had a meeting, and off the record, which is illegal, by the way, for prime ministers, an unrecorded meeting with the editor of the Daily Mail, Paul Dacre. And apparently at that meeting, and it's obviously uh, alleged uh, that Brown asked Dacre if the mayor would support Labour in the 2010 election. And Dacre said, yes, if you do three things, you regrade cannabis from class C to class B. You reduce the top rate of income tax to 45 percent and you put a 2000 uh, a year, 200,000 a year cap on immigration. And Brown agreed to all three things, uh, and he definitely did the first two. He regraded cannabis and he reduced the rate of income tax. Uh, and he also started or actually perpetuated um, and encouraged the penalization of young people or anyone, or at least people they could catch with cannabis. And uh, for a period, the police were cannabis possession offences were seen as a target for the police. And of course, that was um, that was a very easy target to reach because what, what, what policemen would do in most cities was they'd go out on their start of their shift, they'd go into a park, they'd find usually a young black guy, they'd stop him, they'd fill him in his pockets, find a bit of cannabis, give him an, a, a, an, an arrest him for cannabis possession, and then after that, go and do their proper policing. And that led to about a million young people getting criminal records for cannabis possessions.
They get, and that's a real problem because that alters whether you, you know, your job prospects enormously. You, you know, you can't go into the civil service, the police, teaching's difficult. And, uh, and that was, it really undermined people's, young people's, young black people's belief in, uh, in justice as well. And to perpetuate this ban on, uh, uh, on cannabis and pushing it back from class C to class B, it perpetuated the myths of health harms. And they had to do that in order to keep it going, to justify their position. But whatever they've done, it's hardly had any impact on the use of cannabis. And these data uh, show what happened from 1971, when cannabis was ceased to be a medicine, up to the data we well have. There's later data I can talk about briefly, but these are the data we used at a, a major publication a few years ago. And what you see here is the increased use of cannabis over time. So in 1971, the cannabis was used by about half a million people in Britain who had ever used it. And a lot of them were, um, were Afro-Caribbeans from uh, in, living in London. And you can see what is that. 40 years later, the uses have gone up 20 times, number 20 times more people have used it, which means the actual consumption of cannabis has probably gone up by about 100 times. So uh, the law really had very little impact on that. What's happened since is it's gone rather flat uh, so we've still got the order of about 10 million people who've ever used cannabis in this country. One of the justifications for keeping cannabis illegal, uh, both medically and recreationally, was the fear, or the belief the, that it caused schizophrenia. And we did an analysis 10 years ago, looking at that, that, you think a 20 fold increase in the number of users of cannabis might lead to some increase in the number of people with schizophrenia, if it calls schizophrenia. And in fact, there's no increase, if anything, there's a decrease, both in schizophrenia and in other psychoses. And it's just a false premise. And we presented to Gordon Brown this fact that if you wanted to stop, you wanted to use cannabis as a way of reducing schizophrenia and you'd have to stop 5,000 young men or 7,000 young women from ever smoking cannabis to stop one case of schizophrenia which is a completely absurd health target you know to get you know, the, the health gains would be so trivial in comparison with the massive effort it would take to reduce that uh, level of consumption and of course achieving that reduction in consumption through criminalization would add enormously greater harms to society. But they didn't listen and they reclassified it. Uh, Jackie Smith, the Home Secretary, reclassified it in this attempt to win the 2010 election, which they then lost. They lost it partly, of course, because the male did not support them. They did not support, he did not support them in the election at all. It's not surprising. I mean, why would it support a Labour government? Now you might say, well, okay, well, you know, maybe that's not very good politics, that's not very fair, you know, it's all a bit irrational, but does it really matter? Can banning something like cannabis actually do any harm? It must do a little bit of good, it must deter a few people. Well, the answer is done a great deal of harm, and the reason for that is that it's changed the nature of the cannabis market fundamentally. So let me give you a little bit of the background science to cannabis. The traditional cannabis, and I gather that this audience is generally about my age, I'm 71. When you were young and possibly at university and cannabis was be, um, beginning to be used, the cannabis you used was a mixture of two main components, one called Delta 9 THC, and that's what got you stoned, and one called CBD, which you'd never heard of because no one really knew about it then. Cannabidiol is like the anti-stoning agent. And there, cannabidiol protects people against the effects of THC. But the att attempt to penalize cannabis users and to stop importation of cannabis completely changed the market. And uh, over the next uh, 10 years or so, with this clampdown by the Labour government, there was the market switch to homegrown hydroponic production. And that 
essentially drives the plant to make more THC. And in doing that, it ne inevitably loses CBD production. And now we have 90, I think the latest data, 95% of all the cannabis that's sold on the market in the black market in Britain is skunk, which is over 10%. THC, almost no CBD. And that has created a much bigger problem than, we, than the traditional herbal cannabis. Uh, and we can show that. And we knew that at the time. In 2008, Professor Curran at UCL showed that people who smoke skunk, the red bars, have much greater psychotic experiences than people who smoke the traditional mixture or didn't smoke at all. And over here, the people that smoke the traditional mixture actually had less mental health problems or, in terms of loss of energy anyway, than the normal population or those that smoke skunk. So these are the, this is a beneficial effect of cannabis. This is a very negative effect of skunk, but we've created the monster of skunk by trying to stop people using traditional cannabis. And that crea that's created significant problems also in terms of research, because when cannabis was banned, it was put into what's called schedule one of the Misuse of Drugs Act. And that makes it almost impossible to research. So, so the opponents say, it doesn't have any health benefits because you can't prove it's got health benefits. You can't prove it because you can't research it. And it harms were exaggerated. And here you see, look at, this is the number of publications each year on cannabis. And you can see, they were going up and up and up because the science of cannabis was really being discovered. And then suddenly the ban comes in. And for 20 odd years, there's a catastrophic fall off, which is slowly being rectified. But a lot of people who could have benefited from cannabis in this period have been denied access because of the false scaremongering. Now, internationally, things have changed. The Dutch or continue rebelled against US pressure and allowed the coffee shops and medical cannabis. Now, as I've said, most US states have medical cannabis. In many other countries, it, Australia, Israel, Canada. We now have medical cannabis, by the way, yeah, but only four prescriptions in the last four years have been uh, provided on the NHS. It's all in the private system. And that's because our doctors just do not believe that cannabis is a medicine because it wasn't invented in Britain. And we have bizarre, bizarre fears. Like the current chief medical officer, when asked by the health selectivity, what he thought about medical cannabis. He said, well, we've got to be very careful with it because we don't want a thalidomide repeat. And you think, that's kind of weird, isn't it? You know, if 200 million Americans have been taking medical cannabis for 10 years, you might find, if it was going to cause problems, you might have found those already. But there's just this pervasive blinkered ignorance against cannabis in this country. And that's particularly sad because a lot of the science at the molecular level, at the biochemical level of cannabis was done in the UK. But it's slowly changed. The impetus to change was this young man, Billy Caldwell. Severe, severe epilepsy, 2,000 fits a month when he was young. His mother took him to, to America and Canada to get him medical cannabis. And he went into having no fits a month. And then she brought him back to Britain and they confiscated his cannabis at Heathrow. And then two days later, he went into status epilepticus and he was in intensive care. And, and very thankfully, they. He was put into intensive care at St. Thomas's in London, which is conveniently situated exactly across the river from the Houses of Parliament. So as Billy was dying, the MPs could look across and realise the consequences uh, that would happen were he to die when they denied him a proven medicine. And eventually, uh, Sajid Javid, uh, the health secretary at the time, conceded it was a medicine and they allowed him to have access. And uh, sorry, I've... Need uh, there's been, a, as I've said, almost no prescriptions on the NHS. It took Billy two years to get the NHS to prescribe. His mother was continuing to pay for him up to that point. Now, there are many indications to medical cannabis. Then. Some of them are approved by NICE, but these aren't for, these are for extracts of cannabis like THC. There are loads of other potential users. And every day in Britain, and presumably quite a lot of you listening to this programme, are using medical cannabis for various indications. And most of you are getting it from the illegal market. So you don't exactly know what you're getting unless you're growing your own. But why are you using it? Well, this is a survey done a couple of years ago. Large numbers of people are using it for depression, anxiety, for chronic pain, for arthritis, and for neuropathies, but also many other indications. 
The problem we have in Britain is that doctors are reluctant to prescribe because drug companies haven't done trials and most doctors have become so de-skilled they won't make decisions without being told what to do by a drug company. And uh, also, as I said, it's not, wasn't, it's not been invented in Britain and there aren't a lot of RCTs. The reason medical cannabis exists in Britain at all is because patients have found the value in other countries and then brought that value. And we also have a huge problem with NICE. NICE has also been de-skilled. It won't make decisions unless a drug company presents the data in a way that it wants. So uh, 10 years ago when I was sacked by the government, no, 12 years ago now, I set up a charity called Drug Science to actually do what the government wasn't doing and the ACMD wasn't doing, which is telling the truth about drugs and doing research and training on drugs. And uh, three years ago when medicine, 2018, when sorry, to December 28, four years ago, when cannabis was allowed as a medicine, but only by specialists, and as I said, only in the private sector, we decided it would be really helpful to find out whether cannabis worked. So we set up what's called the 2021 Initiative, which is a, a um, essentially a repository of, of data on medical cannabis. And we did a very clever thing. We we, dealt, we, we did a deal with providers, companies that made medical cannabis. And we said that we would collect data for them uh, if they provided at cost medical cannabis for people that needed it. Uh, so people get it at a, at a reduced rate, but they have to put all, their, their data has to go into this register so we can monitor the outcomes. And that has actually turned out to be a remarkable uh, success, uh, as I'll show you now. We, One of the reasons we did it was this audit we conducted on 10 children with severe epilepsy that had themselves been treated by their parents. The parents had gone generally overseas to get hold of medical cannabis for their children's epilepsy. And each of these bars, these two bars, are, each of these is a child. The, blue, the light blue is the number of seizures per month before medical cannabis, and then the blue bar after medical cannabis. And you can see there's a significant there's reduction. The black, the dark bars are smaller than the light bars, and some of them there are no dark bars because they have no seizures at all. This is a log scale. So some of these kids were having ten thousand seizures a month. This one was having about twenty five thousand seizures a month. He doesn't have any seizures now, but still his doctor refuses to believe that that's a real phenomenon due to the drugs. They say, oh, it could be placebo. And the parents say, well, that's ridiculous because he was on seven other drugs before and they didn't work. They would have been placebo, but they still won't prescribe for him. So we, ha we have this on pass between the medical profession and uh, parents who know it's working. And we've done an analysis on this. We know that the next child that goes into this series has got a 92% chance of responding. And that's almost unheard of in medicine, that level of prediction. Doctors would die for that. But... Even if they do want to prescribe medical cannabis, you have to be a specialist. And if even when the specialists want to prescribe, pharmacists often block it. So the parents are left to pay for themselves. In that first series, the parents were paying on average 1,700 pounds a month to keep their children functioning. They were selling their homes. It was, it was it's actually extraordinary, extraordinary sad to see that happening. We've managed to get the price down now through our initiative to about 300 to 450 pounds a month, but that's still pretty disabling for people who are spending a lot of time looking after a child with severe epilepsy. So let me finish by telling you about this 2021 project. It's the UK's biggest national medical cannabis registry. It's a remarkable registry. We have half of all the patients in the world who are using medical cannabis, where, where there is data. So we have data on over half of all the people in the world using cannabis for pain. It's a multi-stakeholder partnership, academics, industry, clinicians, and patients. And, uh, and it's in the public domain. So, so far, we've got 3,200 patients, of which half are in there because of pain, 32% 30, for anxiety syndromes, and then a whole range of other syndromes like epilepsy, ADHD, PTSD, substance use disorders, et cetera. They get prescribed by a doctor 
on condition that they fill out some rating scales. They're not very, they're not oppressive. They only fill the scales out once every three months. What we discovered, and this is one of the reasons why relying on traditional drug company RCTs isn't going to work, is that the vast majority of people in medical cannabis have more than one disorder. Drug companies would only study people with a single disorder like this. Only 8% of our population has got just one disorder. The vast majority have multiple disorders. And now these are real patients. Clinical trials are done in the patients with just one disorder. So anything you find in this small group is unlikely to be representative of the whole population. And they exclu they're excluded from RCTs. So we measure in everyone four variables. One of them is quality of life. And it turns out when this population going into T21, the quality of life is scoring 48 out of 100. That's very poor quality of life. The average quality of life in Britain, from I guess for most of you, is around about 85. So these are very, very uh, people with very, very low qualities of life. Their illnesses are making them suffer. They have disrupted sleep, 63% disrupted sleep patterns that interrupt their daily activities, 40% problems falling asleep, 40% problems staying asleep, and 35% waking up too early, probably with depression. This is the first of what will be many separate publications coming out, but we were able to follow up. Uh, the first follow up is in 2021, 466 individuals. And the quality of life went from 47 to 61. So we almost increased their quality of life by you know, almost 40%. That's a remarkable, I don't, it's almost unheard of for any treatment in medicine to have that big an impact on quality of life. Another remarkable finding was in the pain patients. They, there was a massive reduction in the number of opiates the amount of opiates used in the pain patients. Now, we're not telling them to stop their opiates. We just give them medical cannabis and we say, ask them what happens. And they, they tell us they don't need to use as much opiates. In fact, 40% of them stop using opiates altogether. That's an amazing statistic because, as you know, there's a huge burden of opiate damage, particularly in the USA. So this is a, one of the areas where medical cannabis could revolutionize the treatment in pain reducing the use of opiates. And it works to reduce pain. Pain intensity scores go down by a big effect and interference with daily life scores go down by a big effect. So we are dramatically changing the lives of people with chronic pain. And their quality of life goes up. And because of the success of this and because of demands from patients, we um, decided to open up 2021 to many other disorders. And we've got a whole series of disorders here where we are monitoring what is, uh, what is going on. And, and you might, this is, turns out to be remarkably interesting. So for instance, endometriosis. Uh, we've now got quite a few people with endometriosis who are telling us there are significant benefits. And that has spawned a company to go away and do a, a specific trial in endometriosis. But the one that I find most interesting is this syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And some of you may have this. It's a syndrome of connective tissue problems where the joints dislocate all the time. Now, this is a rare syndrome and there's no treatment for it. But it turns out that medical cannabis can revolutionize patients. And this is a case report from one of our patients, Lucy. And she had severe Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Her, her hips dislocated and her jaw dislocated. Her jaw dislocated to a point where it could not be put back. She was in severe pain. She was on intravenous opiates for the pain and she could not eat or drink. So she was on intravenous feeding. She spent large amounts of time in intensive care in Addenbrooke's in Cambridge to the point where she was gonna die. And her physician said, look, I, the only thing I can suggest is medical cannabis. And she said, can you prescribe? And, and, and they said, no. So her in a wheelchair and her mother went to the Netherlands and lived in the Netherlands, got medical cannabis, and it's transformed her life. She has now gone from being in intensive care 
to being a second year undergraduate in Sussex University walking with a stick or because of medical cannabis. Everyone who knows her knows it's transformed her life. She's saved the NHS hundreds of thousands of pounds a year because she's no longer in intensive care. Her doctors want to prescribe it for her on the NHS, but the NHS says, no, there is no evidence it worked. And you think, at what point do you have to accept that they're being irrational? Well, it might just be she was a strange one-off. Well, luckily, in this group of 3,000 patients, we've now got, how many have we got? We've got 38 patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. It's one of the more largest uh, cohorts of Ehlers-Danlos patients in the world. And uh, we've been able to show that they get better on medical cannabis. No, we've never been done before, but they get better. Their pain severity gets better and their interference with life gets better. So we're kind of rewriting medical textbooks as a result of this initiative. And there are many other disorders which are, you know, could be treated. This is a recent paper of ours looking at the, the indications of medical cannabis and anxiety is one of them. And what we've shown with the anxiety patients, the first 330 anxiety patients, we found that there's again a very marked reduction, halving anxiety scores in three months. That's pretty good, isn't it? Using, a, using medicines which you know, doesn't, don't cause dependence or withdrawal. So I'm gonna stop now, it gives us 10 minutes for questions. If you wanna read more about the science, this is the book on cannabis I just published recently. It tells you all about it. This tells you more about um, the other drugs. And, and if you're interested in um, having medical cannabis, then just go onto the website of the drug science website, which I'm going to find you here. And you can just log in and register. And then you can be seen for, um, look, go onto the drug science website, look up Project 2021. And uh, you can then register for a, an a, a appointment. I think it costs about £75 to have an assessment. And then if you um, get deemed to be uh, a potential candidate that medical cannabis will help, you can then get it prescribed. So I'll stop now and take questions. Thank you.